computers. Um, she described one possible post-quantum uh, method for cryptography that was based on using paths in isogeny graphs of elliptic curves over finite fields, which it is uh, quite a hot new topic. Um, but today I want to discuss another source of quantum hard problems um, based on lattices and that have been proposed for use in uh, post-quantum cryptographic systems. I'll try to keep this talk mostly self-contained while at the same time not repeating too much of what Kristen said, but I probably um, won't quite succeed in either of those, but I'll try. So start, uh, first a quick uh, run through about um, cryptography. Uh, in the dark ages, which is what cryptographers call the pre-1970s, uh, the basic problem is the two protagonists, Bob and Alice, want to exchange secret information. So say Bob wants to send a message to Alice that their adversary, Eve, the eavesdropper, cannot read. Um, so this is what they do. First, Bob and Alice share some secret key. Then Bob uses the secret key to encrypt his message. Bob sends the encrypted message to Alice, who decrypts it, also using the secret key. And Eve, even though she can intercept the encrypted message, can't read it because she doesn't know the secret key. Um, I'll just mention that in cryptography talks, people tend to put things in red if they're secret and in green if they're public knowledge. So that's what the color encoding there is. It's to kind of help keep track of what's what. Um, the problem with this is that Bob and Alice can't exchange messages until they've exchanged a secret key. So they have to meet up in some way or other, or they have to send the secret key by some channel that potentially could be intercepted. Um, and this is how cryptography worked from, um, who knows how long ago, up until the 1970s. And there's the problem, that they need to exchange or share a secret key before they can get going. Um, so, what happens if they've never met and they have no secure communication channel? Um, and this became especially relevant once the internet existed. So for example, if Alice is Amazon and the message is Bob's credit card number, they've never previously communicated, but he wants to send his credit card number so that he can buy stuff. Okay. So in the mid-1970s, Diffie and Hellman proposed creating, a, creating crypto systems that used two different keys, a private key that Alice keeps secret and a public key that she publishes. And the idea is that Bob only needs the public key to encrypt his message and create the encrypted message. Okay, so the um, cryptographic terms for the, the message is usually called the plain text and the encrypted message is the ciphertext. Alice uses the private key to decrypt the ciphertext and recover the message, but Eve can't do that because she doesn't know the private key, she only knows the public key. Um, and in the interest of historical accuracy, I should mention that the British Secret Service kind of worked this out also, but they didn't publish any of it till much, much later. Um, anyway, this, this is a really fascinating idea. Diffie and Hellman weren't actually able to propose an explicit example of this, but they became known as public key crypto systems because of the fact that there's this public key that's used for encryption, but the public key doesn't allow you to decrypt. All right, let's formulate this mathematically since we're all mathematicians. Encryption and decryption are actually functions. Okay, so there's an encryption function, which I've represented by this black box. The input is Bob's plain text, his message, and Alice's public key. The output is Bob's ciphertext. Alice then feeds her private key into the decryption function, and out comes Bob's plain text. But in order for the decryption function to work, you need the private key that that pairs with the public key. That's the idea. Eve knows the public key, but she doesn't know the private key, so she can't decrypt. 
Um, the pair of functions encrypt decrypt is an example of a trapdoor function and its inverse, which means it's a function that's easy to compute, so easy to compute encryption, hard to compute the inverse of encryption to go from the ciphertext to the plain text unless you know this extra piece of information, the trap door, which enables you to, to compute the inverse. All right, that's, that's how to send messages. Another side of public key cryptography, which is really important, um, is digital signatures. So I want to just quickly mention how those work also. Here, Alice has a document that she wants to sign. It could be a contract. Um, uh, a publisher might want to digitally sign a book or, well, I'll get to some, another application later. And so instead of encrypt and decrypt functions, there's a sign function and a verify function. And what she does is she takes her document, which is public, and she also feeds in her private signing key, runs them through the function and gets out her signed document. Now what happens? Well, Bob or Eve or anyone for that matter, takes the signed document, takes Alice's public verification key, runs them through the ver verify function and gets either yes, the signature is valid or no, the signature is not valid. And if the public key and the private key are a matching pair, then the answer should be yes. Digital signatures are at least as important as public key crypto systems in, for modern communications. Um, a typical example, I mean, what your cell phone, cell phone is constantly updating the apps. And how does it know that an app update is legitimate? And it really does need to know that because there are lots of uh, players out there who would love to install software on your phone. The answer is that when the app is created, it's digitally signed by the manufacturer and your phone verifies the signature of the update before it installs it. Okay, how does one build a trapdoor function to use for public key crypto systems or digital signature schemes? Um, so cryptography tends to have a lot of abbreviations. I think computer science probably does too in general, but um, so PKC is a public key crypto system. DSS is a digital signature scheme. Anyway, we want to build these from hard math problems. Here are three examples that have been used quite a lot. There's the integer factorization problem, which is given to prime numbers. If I tell you their product, PQ, it's hard for you to find P and Q. There are various ways to exploit this. One of the most common in the first one was using the uh, powering function. So you take a number and raise it to the eth power where e is known and p times q is known. And it's easy to compute this powering function, but it's actually quite hard to invert it unless you know p and q. In fact, conjecturally, it's equally hard. In other words, to invert, you, you really do need to know p and q. So the integer factorization problem in this exponentiation form was used um, by Rivesh Shamir and Edelman to create the RSA crypto system um, and also a digital signature scheme, which works similarly to the um, public key crypto system. So the public key is the product PQ and the exponent, the private key is the individual primes. And probably everyone's already seen this. I'm not gonna go over how these actually, the crypto systems work, that's another talk. A second problem that was proposed is the discrete log problem. And in fact, Diffie and Hellman used this in this paper to create what's called a key exchange, which is a slightly weaker than a public key crypto system. Um, anyway, so here's the problem. Take a large prime or prime power. Take, say, a generator or an element of large order in the multiplicative group of a finite field and look at the powering function, which takes a number m and just raises g to the mth power. Again, easy to raise things to powers. Hard, if I give you g to the m, it's hard to find m. That's a, m is, a, is the discrete logarithm. It's a, right, it's a version of the logarithm in this group. 
Um, the discrete logs used to build what's called the El Gamal public key crypto system and digital signature schemes. The public key is the prime, well, the field, the generator, and some particular power. Um, and the private key is the power. There is a similarly a discrete log problem for any algebraic group. You can do it for the additive group where it's really easy to solve. Um, people also use it for elliptic curves. So if we re replace the multiplicative group with the points on an elliptic curve over a finite field, you have the same kind of problem. If I, if I give you the point Q and M times Q, you have to find M. So that's the elliptic curve discrete log problem, or ECDLP. Um, so ECDLP is widely used for an elliptic curve version of El Gamal. Why bother using elliptic curves when the discrete log itself is much easier? I mean, multiplying numbers in a finite field is easier than adding points on an elliptic curve. At least the formulas are easier. Well, the answer is that the elliptic curve discrete log problem is at least as far as we know at the moment, harder than the other two problems. What that means is that the keys and the ciphertext can be smaller. And this is really the big battle in all of cryptography. You want to be really, really, really efficient, but you also don't want to be insecure. So you play these two things off against each other, and there are countless examples of crypto systems which are secure, but they're just really not efficient enough to be useful. So people tweak them to make them more efficient. And every time you tweak them, you wreck the security. It's, it's very, very delicate usually. But anyway, this is why people use elliptic curves. Um, and here's a real world example for those who like to speculate in Bitcoin. A, a blockchain such as Bitcoin stores millions of digital signatures in the chain. Um, and to save on space and save on bandwidth because the, uh, the, the blockchain has to be transmitted uh, all over, um, elliptic curve digital signatures are used. That was what was in the original proposal and that's what's, what's still used today. Okay, so how hard are these problems? Well, let's be honest. No one knows. As far as we know, these problems are, well, they could even be quasi-linear or conceivable or say quadratic time. They could be really, really easy. Just no one's figured out how to solve them. So we don't have a proof. So, so the, the proof, if you like, uh, that they're hard is that no one knows a good way to solve them. The practical answer for modern cryptography is how hard are they to solve using existing algorithms, keeping in mind someone might invent a better algorithm tomorrow. And that's happened before. For example, for factorization, um, new sieve methods were created. So anyway, so here are the three problems. Here's roughly how many steps it takes to solve them, very roughly. Um, you don't really need to parse what those mean, except that the first two are smaller than the third one. And that means as a practical matter, if you're using integer factorization or discrete logs, your ciphertexts and keys will be in the, you know, a few thousand bits. Well, for elliptic curves, they can be a few hundred bits. Is that a big difference? Well, even 4,000 bits isn't that much, but there's this caveat, which you probably noticed, existing algorithms on existing computers. What about computers that don't yet exist? So that's where quantum computers come in. Um, I know very little about quantum algorithms, so I, I'll just say a word or two, that a quantum computer is a machine in which computation on bits is replaced by computation on quantum bits, which are essentially um, probability distributions. So a quantum computer, <clears throat> that has n qubits can do a simultaneous computation of two to the n states. Um, so essentially, well, you can see the numbers there, you get an exponential speed up. Assuming you can figure out an algorithm that will operate um, on a quantum computer. 
the largest quantum computers that have currently been built have a handful of qubits. Um, I used to, when I gave talks about this, put in, you know, four qubits or eight qubits, but, but it, it keeps increasing. So I'll, I'll just say a handful. Um, it's certainly more than eight and it's certainly less than a hundred at the moment. Uh, but there's huge amounts of money being invested um, in this to build quantum computers. Um, for a while there, a good way to get grants was to put quantum computer and quantum cryptography into your uh, grant proposal, but, but they've wised up a bit on that. You actually have to have ideas. Um, anyway, so I kind of like this analogy. Uh, let's look at uh, flight. So the first airplane, powered airplane flight, was in 1903. It went 852 feet. Fifteen years later, there were aircraft all over the battlefields of World War I. And 20 years after that, we had jets going 500 miles an hour. So, I mean, yes, building airplanes may be as easier than building quantum computers, though maybe not. I mean, they're pretty clever engineers. Um, but if you want to predict what's going to happen in 10 or 15 years, ooh, tricky. If you want to predict what's going to happen in 40 years, that's really, really hard. So where did all of this start? As far as I know, there's this paper of Peter Shores in 1994 called Polynomial Time Algorithms for Prime Factorization and Discrete Logarithms on a Quantum Computer. And he gave algorithms that would run on a quantum computer that would solve the integer, the, that would solve factorization of integers and discrete logs in polynomial time. In fact, more or less in quadratic time. They're really fast algorithms. And although I don't think the original paper mentioned it, uh, you can adapt the discrete log thing to do elliptic curve discrete logs too. So a full-scale quantum computer will pretty much kill all the classical public key cryptography that I mentioned on previous slides. So people started looking for computer systems that couldn't be broken by a quantum computer. What do I mean by couldn't be broken? I mean, as far as we know, no one has created, no one has figured out an algorithm on a quantum computer to break them. Will someone find such algorithms tomorrow? Who knows? Um, but that's about the best we can do at the moment. So the field's currently called post-quantum cryptography. Post-quantum really meaning post-quantum computers, when, when quantum computers are built. So here's a little bit of what's happening in the real world. Kristen already mentioned some of this. In 2016, the NIST, the US National Institute of Standards and Technology, which has been running crypt cryptography competitions to pick crypto systems for use, public things, that, I mean, they're, they're really good. They issued a report on post-quantum cryptography. So this was their best estimate, meaning some expert panel, that they were guessing a quantum computer capable of breaking 2,000-bit RSA, which is fairly standard at the moment, um, to break it in a matter of hours could be built in 2030. So at that point, it was 15 years, now 10 years, for a budget of about a billion dollars. So start saving your pennies, and in 10 years, you'll be able to buy your snow. But a billion dollars for a government is really not very much money. And in fact, a billion dollars for a criminal enterprise, that is a lot of money. But if you could use it to strip the full worth of all the Bitcoin uh, wallets in, in existence, it would be money well spent. Um, so anyway, so, so NIST instituted a competition to create digital signatures, dig, digital signature schemes and public key encryption schemes um, that, are, that would be safe, including after the advent of quantum computers. So how did they do that? Well, they solicited proposals. They got, I meant to look it up, I have 40 or 50 or 60 proposals at least. Um, and there was a public comment period and a lot of people weighed in and then they um, eliminated some of them and there were more comment periods and revisions and things. Um, so actually I, got, I got, just got to update this. So last week they got down to their round three candidates 
And the round three candidates include four public key crypto systems and three digital signature schemes that are um, pr under primary consideration. And there were another about maybe six of each that are under secondary consideration still. So that brings me to the mathematics part of the part, talk, which was about lattices. So for the rest of the talk, I want to talk about uh, a little bit about lattices and hard lattice problems, and then explain how they can be used to create public key crypto systems or digital signatures. And then at the end, I'll talk about a particular system um, that actually was invented quite, quite a few years ago, but some of us recently have been working with to um, use it for some particular applications, which I will get to at the end, if I have time, which I might actually have time for. I hope I didn't zip through that too quickly, um, but I wanted to get to the math part. Okay, so public key crypto and hard lattice problems. In the mid 1990s, right around the time that Shor's uh, paper appeared, a bunch of cryptographers and mathematicians were looking at hard lattice problems um, to use them for cryptography. This wasn't because of quantum computers, which no one at the time, I think really had in their on their radar screens, um, but they were doing that for the following reason. First, Itai and Dwork in this beautiful paper, um, you created a public key crypto system whose sort of worst case um, security, uh, I'm sorry, whose average case security was equal to its worst case security, right? So just think back to RSA with integer factorization. Even if we could prove that um, there are, products of primes that are hard to factor, that doesn't mean that the two particular primes you chose are hard to factor their product. So the, the, um, results like this are really nice because they say that, that if you pick a random instance of your problem, there's a pretty good chance that it is as hard as the hardest case of your problem. Now the crypto system they created with it, unfortunately really wasn't um, practical. I, I mean, it had, multi thousands of bits for the messages to send one bit of information or something. Um, but it was really interesting. The other reason people looked at hard lattice problems um, was the, the hope that one could create encryption schemes and digital signatures that are much, much faster than the classical schemes, the elliptic curve schemes, the um, RSA type schemes. Um, I mean, those schemes are relatively fast. There's no problem on a processor like on your phone, but for example, if you wanted your, uh, the chip on your credit card to do digital signature processing, there's not much processing power there. Um, so Jeff Hofstein, Jill Pfeiffer, and I started working on this in, in the mid 1990s, and Goldreich, Goldwasser, and Halevi also independently were working on it. Um, Neither of us knew the others were doing it at the time. But later, interest in these systems really blossomed because it was pointed out that, in fact, there are no quantum algorithms that will solve these hard lattice problems in polynomial or even sub-exponential time. There is a bit of a speed up just because um, there's a quantum search algorithm that sort of gives a square root improvement. But that's, that's the best known. OK. So what's a lattice? A lattice of dimension n is just a, the z linear span of n independent vectors in Rn. So it's just, we, we pick v1, v2, vn um, to be a basis of n space. And we just take all the linear combinations, but with integer coefficients. The vectors v1 through vn are a basis for L, but of course a, a lattice will have lots of bases. Just like a, well, I mean, a vector space has lots of bases. In lattices, it's not, there's not quite as much flexibility, but there's still lots of different bases. And some bases are better than others, which I'll explain later what I mean by that. So 
So a useful concept is if you're given a basis, then the fundamental domain for the lattice is the parallel pipet, so a higher dimensional parallelogram, where you just take the linear combinations of the basis vectors with t running from zero to one. So that's lots of definitions, but a picture makes it really clear. Here's an example, a two-dimensional example. The dots are really, of course, vectors in the lattice. Um, these two vectors are a basis, and here's the fundamental domain spanned by that basis. So in lattices, there are two real, well, there, I mean, there are lots of problems one can formulate, but two really, really important computational problems, which had been studied long before any of this crypto stuff uh, came about, are the shortest vector problem and the closest vector problem. Again, with the abbreviations SVP, CVP. The shortest vector problem, it's exactly what it sounds like. Find the shortest vector in the lattice. Well, the shortest non-zero vector. Oh, I write it, the lattice is a group, it always contains zero. A closest vector problem is given a vector that's not in the lattice, find the lattice, well, find a lattice vector that's closest. Now, both of these have approximate versions too, which is what's used in cryptography and actually in many applications. Rather than finding the shortest non-zero vector, it's often enough to find a vector that's quite short, or find a vector that's quite close to t, even if it's not the absolutely closest vector. Okay, so in practice, these two problems are more or less of equal difficulty. Um, I think there's actually a proof one direction and a plausibility argument the other, but anyway, in, in practice, <clears throat> solving the closest vector problem in dimension n, you can usually set it up as a shortest vector problem in dimension n plus one. So more or less the same. So I'm going to ignore this di distinction. So how does one try to solve the closest vector problem? Here's an idea. So these two vectors are my basis vectors, OK? So someone gives me this target vector, and I'm trying to find a close vector in the lattice. So what do I do? Well, I take the fundamental domain that I, you know, this is the standard fundamental domain, and I translate it so that the target point is in the translated fundamental domain. That's actually easy to do, in fact. Um, I'll say it in words. Mathematically, just express T as a real linear combination of the basis. Uh-oh. Are you hearing this? No. We are You're not hearing me? That's fine. We are hearing you, but nothing. Uh, OK, way. hold on one second. I, I, I'm hearing feedback. I'm going to turn off my um, headphones. I do hear you. I can hear you. So we hear you well, Joe. I can hear you. Uh, so, so for some reason, my compute, my um, headphones seem to have died. Um, can you hear me? No, we hear you. Yes, we hear you. Okay, no, I'm using the, the computer's um, microphone now, and I'll speak louder. Okay, good. No, actually, I hear you even louder now. So oh, you hear me louder? Okay, so I'll be quieter. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> okay, anyway, if I'm not loud enough, tell me. Um, anyway, you just take the vector T and write it as a real linear combination of the um, uh, basis vectors and take the greatest integer of each coefficient. Um, and, and, and you'll get this fundamental domain that contains the um, target vector. And then you just take the vertex in that fundamental domain that's closest, and there's your candidate. And you can see, I, I did, I found the closest lattice point to the target vector. But I was kind of, the reason that works is because this basis is reasonably orthogonal. So that's what I mean by a good basis, a basis that's fairly short and reasonably orthogonal. So let me give you an example of a bad basis. 
So the red basis here is a good basis. You can see it's fairly orthogonal. These two green vectors span the same lattice, but they're not orthogonal at all. Now look what happens if I try to solve the closest vector problem using the bad basis. There's a target point. I just kind of chose at random. This is the fundamental domain, this, this long skinny thing that contains the target point. So I choose the vertex of the fundamental domain that's closest. There it is. Not so bad, except that is not the closest lattice point, right? The closest lattice point's here, the red point. OK. If you've never really worked with this stuff, I can see people rolling their eyes. And if someone gives you the target point, you could just eyeball where the closest lattice point is. OK? And that's true, because although these pictures are great, two dimensions is too small to get an idea of how hard these things are. In two dimensions, these problems are very, very easy. And in fact, I don't know whether he's the first one, but, but, but Gauss had a very efficient, very efficient algorithm for solving the closest vector and shortest vector problems in two dimensions. And actually, it's pretty easy in dimensions three, four, five, 10, whatever. Um, and during, in, in the early 1980s, uh, Lenster, Lenster, and Lovash came up with a lattice reduction algorithm, now called the L-cubed algorithm, um, that's actually pretty efficient even in higher dimensions. Um, and their algorithm has been extended and um, by, by a whole bunch of people. That there's a lot of research and ongoing research um, on lattice reduction algorithms. And L cubed finds a pretty good basis in polynomial time. And that suffices for many applications. Well, polynomial time in sort of the coefficients of the basis vectors. Um, yeah, okay. No, I'm sorry. It, it, polynomial in, in the um, dimension of the lattice. But if you want to find a really good basis, um, even using lattice reduction algorithms like L cubed, um, the problem still seems to be exponentially hard, exponential in the dimension. So dimension 10, not so bad. Dimension 50, getting harder. Dimension 10,000, no way. Um, and the really important thing for all of this in terms of quantum crypto is there are no known quantum algorithms to solve shortest vector or closest vector problems in polynomial or even sub-exponential time, even if you have a working quantum computer with lots of quantum bits and lots of quantum storage. OK, so I thought I'd explain how one can create a digital signature scheme using the closest vector problem. This one's not actually efficient enough to be useful, but it was um, one of the earliest ones that was proposed um, by Goldreich, Goldwasser, and Halevi. So there's the good basis. That's Alice's private key. Here's her good basis. And here's the bad basis. That's her public key. So Alice publishes, publishes these two vectors. Now, she wants to sign a document. Technically, you, she runs her document and her public key through what's called a hash function. Anyway, it, it's used to create a random vector that is tied to her document. OK? And probably tied to her, her public key also. But anyway, so, so there's this random vector. That's not a lattice vector. Now, Alice knows this good basis, right? So she can use that procedure I had on a couple slides ago just by taking the fundamental domain for this basis, translating it until the target points in it, and then picking the closest, um, closest vertex in that fundamental domain. So she can find a nearby vector. It may well actually be the closest lattice vector. In any case, it's very close. 
because she has this good basis she can use. Notice that when Alice publishes this vector, the way she publishes it is she publishes it as multiples, as a linear combination of the bad basis. So she uses her good basis to find the signature vector, but she publishes it as a linear combination of the bad basis. That means Bob or anyone who wants to verify the signature, well, they can check that the signature vector, the lattice vector she published, is close to the document vector. That's just checking distances. And they can check that the signature vector is actually in Alice's lattice because they can check that it's in the lattice generated by the bad basis. Right? If I give you two vectors and I give you a third vector and ask, is it an in integer linear combination of the first two vectors? Well, that's easy. You just write it as a real linear combination and check if the real coefficients are integers. Okay, so the GGH digital signature scheme versus L cubed. The security comes down to how good L cubed is at solving this closest vector problem which basically comes down to how good is L cubed at finding a pretty good basis? And the answer is in dimensions less than, a fa less than 100, um, versions of L cubed finds a good enough basis to break GGH. And even up to around 200, you would probably break it. Um, but uh, GGH public key, remember, is a basis for the lattice. So that's n vectors, each of which has n coordinates. So that means the public key has about n squared bits. N squared, well, big O of n squared. And that gets pretty big if n is, you know, like 500. So if you take a value for n that makes GGH secure, the keys are likely to be on the order of two megabits or so. You remember how big the elliptic curve keys were? They were like three or 400 bits. So this is or many orders of magnitude larger. Okay, so independently of the work that, that GG and H were doing, and more or less at the same time, Jeff Hofstein, Jill Pfeiffer and I uh, we're working in a public key crypto system called Entry. And I really, actually, I really want to stress, this was really Jeff Hofstein's idea, and he recruited Jill and me to help him develop it. And, um, so, I mean, we did develop it as a team, but the initial idea was really Jeff's. Um, and Entry is also a lattice-based system, but it uses a, what I'd call a cyclotomic lattice which means that the basis vectors are, um, well, actually they're just barrel shifts. The, the coordinates are just barrel shifts of one another. So basically you can specify the entire lattice just by giving one vector and use it to generate the other um, basis vectors. So this added symmetry allowed us to get down to keys that were roughly RSA size, not all the way down to elliptic curve size. That would be the gold, gold standard. But um, you know, two to four thousand bits uh, or eight thousand bit keys. Say there are now lots and lots of cryptographic constructions based on hard lattice problems, and most of the round three proposals, uh, NIST round three proposals, in fact, are lattice based. So in the remaining, um, you know, ten minutes or so. I'd like to describe an old lattice-based system, which actually, I mean, I, I, the original sort of prototype for it actually predates entry by a few years even, but it's been modified and changed over the years in various ways. Um, and the reason I thought I'd describe it is twofold. First, it's actually based on some kind of cool mathematics. Um, and we, I'll mention who, um, have recently figured out how to use it to do signature amalgamation. And I'll mention at the end why that's an interesting thing to do. So a prototype of, of PASS, as in a little note at the bottom, dates back to 1997, and many people have worked on developing it and 
doing things with it. I list a bunch of the names down there. Um, and I apologize if I've left anyone out. So, although, pa uh, although PASS is a ultimately a lattice-based system in the sense the security depends on the difficulty of a hard lattice problem, the way it's really constructed uses the discrete Fourier transform, which is the cool math. At least I think it's cool. So how do Fourier transforms work? Well, you start with a finite field. Pick your fi favorite finite field. Uh, take a primitive nth root of unity in that field. where So n would be some divisor of q minus 1. And just for now, sort of file in the back of your mind, a subset T of the numbers from zero to N minus one, rough, roughly half the numbers from zero to N minus one, okay? Okay, what is the discrete Fourier transform? It's a map from the n-dimensional vector space over FQ to the n-dimensional vector space over Q, FQ. It sends the vector AI, so that's A1 through AN, to the vector AI hat, where AI hat, the, co the coordinates of the Fourier transform are just obtained by taking the coefficients of the original vector, basically using them to form a polynomial and plugging in values of zeta, uh, powers of, of zeta, one zeta, zeta squared, zeta cubed. So the original formulation of PASS actually was in terms of polynomial evaluation. That's what the P stands for. Um, well, you can think of this as multiplying the original vector by this van der Mond matrix that has powers of zeta in it. Anyway, that's the discrete Fourier transform. Um, for cryptographic purposes, the ends that we use are not that big. They're in the thousands. So, I mean, computing this is not that time consuming anyway. But of course, as, as people probably know, there, there are fast Fourier transform methods. So, in principle, there are n coordinates here, each of which takes time n to compute. So that's O of n squared. But in fact, you can do the computation in time O of n log n using a, a fast Fourier transform, using fast Fourier methods. OK, in any case, the, these things are easy to compute and fast. And in fact, it's invertible. That, this is a bijection. Uh, as long I, as long as um, what? No. Yeah, and, and n's relatively prime to q. It's a bijection, and it, I may be cheating a little bit here, but essentially it gives a ring homomorphism, and it's a really cool ring homomorphism, because what we do on the left hand vector space, we use convolution product. Um, which if you know convolution product, um, fine. If, if you don't, basically think of the vectors here as actually just being coefficients of a polynomial. Then multiply the two polynomials and set um, x to q minus, x, set x to n equal to one. So that's uh, some sort of multiplication on this side. And on the other side, we take multiplication where we just multiply component by component. OK? So the multiplication, the convolution multiplication is a bit more complicated than the component-wise multiplication. Anyway, this is all really standard um, uh, classical mathematics. So the problem that I want to use is what's known as the partial um, Fourier transform problem. So suppose instead of giving you the entire list of uh, Fourier coefficients, I just pick out some of them using this set T of indices, OK? So I'll let A hat sub T just be the Fourier coefficients for the indices in T. So I'm going to give you half the Fourier coefficients, say. And my challenge to you is find the vector I started with. Well, you can't do that in general because I could have started with lots of vectors. Remember, I said this map is one to one. 
But if I take, if I only give you some of the coordinates here, there'll be lots of coordinates that get mapped to it. All right? I mean, the kernel of the linear transformation will be big. But I'm also going to give you extra information. I'm going to tell you the initial vector I started with had very small coordinates compared to Q, the, you know, the prime I'm, I'm working with. Uh, in fact, typically one might take the initial data, the, this vector Q to have all of its coefficients to be 0, 1, or minus 1. Okay? But the actual value of this vector is secret. But now there's probably only one vector, say, with coefficients 0, 1, and minus 1, that has these Fourier coefficients, even though I've only given you half the Fourier coefficients. And that's the challenge problem. That's the, prob that's the hard problem. Given partial Fourier data, data of a small vector, recover the vector. Um, so why is this a lattice problem? Well, let me translate it into a lattice problem for you. If I take the Fourier transform, that's this ring homomorphism, and I project onto the t coordinates specified by the indices in t, then if I start, basically what I'm, I'm starting with a small vector in z to the n, I'm giving you its image here, and I'm asking you to invert that. Well, what you do is you look at the kernel of this map phi. That'll be a sublattice of z to the n. So here's how you can solve the problem at the top of this slide. First, I'm giving you a point here. This is just a linear transformation. Pick any vector in the domain that goes to the target vector, OK? That's just a, a linear algebra problem, basically a linear algebra problem over FQ. It won't be the right answer because the vector you get will have large coordinates, but it's a candidate. So you pick a vector which has the right image, OK? Um, then that's a vector in this, um, well, now you find a vector in this kernel lattice that's close to alpha. That's a hard problem. That's a closest vector problem. But if you can solve the closest vector problem, um, then, then you can do that. So if, if you choose parameters, this will be a hard closest vector problem. Um, in general. And then, in fact, the target vector, my secret vector, will simply be this arbitrary um, vector that goes to the right place minus the vector in the kernel that gets you a small vector. Okay? So that's how solving the closest vector problem will solve this partial um, discrete Fourier inversion problem. Oh, good. Okay. So I have like two more slides, I think. Maybe three. Um, so here's how to use that to create a digital signature scheme. Alice's private signing key is just some short vector, say with all ones, minus ones, and zeros. She publishes its Fourier transform, but only part of the Fourier transform. If she wants to sign a document, she chooses a random vector, completely random. She uses the partial Fourier transform of that random vector and her document to create a random vector in um, FQ to the N. This gamma ties her, will tie her signature to the document. She computes her secret short vector, convolution product, this, vec this vector that um, she created with the hash, or that should be red actually, plus the random vector. 
And her signature is the partial Fourier transform of the random vector and um, the signature vector. How does Bob verify the signature? Well, first, he knows this partial Fourier transform of the random vector. He knows the document, so he can do the hash, he can recreate gamma. Well, since he knows all of gamma, he can compute its Fourier transform. He does a computation in the ring where you're just doing coordinate-wise multiplication to compute, and, and he checks that that matches up with the partial Fourier transform of Alice's signature. He knows the whole signature vector, so he can compute this. And also he checks that that signature vector was short. Okay, so I, this is a lot to take in if you haven't seen it before, but I just wanted to indicate it, it's really just very straightforward computations in these two rings, one where you're doing convolution product, one where you're doing coordinate wise product. And taking these Fourier transforms, which is just a linear transformation. Okay, so the classical schemes based on integer factorization or discrete logs will be killed off by quantum computers. The digital signature schemes in the NIST competition, in the round three NIST competition, their signature sizes are at least comparable to RSA. They're in the thousands of bits. Not to this gold standard where, you, where the keys and, and messages are in the few hundreds of bits and the signatures are in the hundreds of bits. Um, is that important? Well, depends on the application. For your computer, for your cell phone, 4,000 bit keys are fine. But for blockchains that where you're storing and transmitting millions of signatures, this extra order of magnitude can make a difference. Um, so, Yark and Doros, Jeff and Burke Sunar and I, um, have been working on some stuff. We created a variant of pass that allows you to am amalgamate lots and lots of signatures into one signature that's much smaller than storing all the signatures together. So one signature is, well, I wrote 2,000 bits or 4,000 bits. Anyway, it's, it's, it's a standard sort of RSA size signature, okay? But if you want to amalgamate n signatures, N signatures, each additional signature, it only takes you know a few hundred bits, so roughly elliptic curve size signatures. So basically you can store a million signatures in about the same size using this variant of pass as you could using the elliptic curve systems. Why bother? Well, because at least potentially these lattice-based systems are secure against quantum computers while the elliptic curve systems aren't. So in conclusion, I want to thank everyone for being here, but this is my current mantra. Quantum computers are coming for you. Everyone should start preparing now. In particular, if you have something you want to keep secret for a year, don't worry about it too much. 10 years, you probably do want to worry. 50 years, I would not for example, sign a contract that you want to be secure for 50 years using any of the current systems without also adding a, a quantum secure signature. Um, you can do both, and that's what people should really be doing at this point. They should um, you know, put RSA signatures at, or elliptic curve signatures and one of these quantum secure signatures in at the same time. Anyway, so finally, Thank you very much for coming. And I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this seminar, many of which I've attended. These have been really great. So I want to also thank all the people who have spoken at, at the uh, NTW seminar so far. It's been really wonderful. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jim, for your wonderful talk. Let us please unmute so that we can talk to Joe.